Good afternoon. I call to order the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners staff meeting of April 13th. Good afternoon, Madam Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, our clerk of court, our clerk of the board, <laughs> Jackie Paniotto. <laughs> I'll get it right. I'll get it right. But I certainly want to include you. And then we have Jeff Aludo, who's on here somewhere. Um, why don't we get started and convene because we have quite a few um, items to cover today. Um, and our first item on the agenda is uh, updates, new dates, and current status of COVID-19 spread, testing, vaccinations. And um, Commissioner Greg Kesterman is here. Hi, Greg. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me again. Uh, as mentioned uh, in your press release, Commissioner, uh, good timing with regards to new information about the Janssen vaccine. So I'll provide some information about that in my presentation this afternoon. Great. Um, if you could confirm after I uh, click here that you can see my screen. Yes, mm -hmm, we can. Perfect, thank you so much. So today in Hamilton County, uh, really not a lot of change um, on many fronts since I last addressed this commission. Uh, we have 77,848 cases of COVID uh, from the beginning of the pandemic to date. And essentially the majority of those have recovered. There are, however, still about 3,200 cases of active COVID-19 within our community. So lots of still opportunities to get, to get COVID-19 and just that constant reminder that as vaccine comes, we just need to continue to be careful until we're able to get um, enough of our population vaccinated. When you look at our overall case count, December 10th remains our highest number of cases. Uh, we were at 716 cases per day on a uh, seven day average. Today on a seven day average, we are much closer to 98 cases per day. There continues to be, if you look, a few small spikes that continue when you look at our 14 day rolling average uh, in a few moments on the Ohio alert system. Those few days do continue to keep Hamilton County above uh, the threshold um, necessary to transition out of a county with high incidence of COVID. The other thing I'll point out, I added uh, an update for my jurisdiction with regards to the variants that are known within Hamilton County. There are seven of the UK variant, one of the South African variant, and one of the California variant currently within Hamilton County's uh, jurisdiction. I know the city of Cincinnati also has variants. I don't know the uh, specific breakdown or numbers for those variants. The good news though continues to be, we knew there would be variants the same uh, prevention techniques uh, will help prevent the spread of these variants and the vaccines are effective against these variants. So I think those are still two good pieces of news. <clears throat> I share this demographic. We've heard a little bit of talk around Ohio about some surge or increase in cases. Obviously the first uh, chart there is the state of Ohio as a whole. Uh, it's a little more dramatic when you look at uh, Cuyahoga County, you can see quite an uptick in the number of cases being managed uh, within Cuyahoga County. A similar trend in Franklin County, although not as dramatic. Just to reiterate, Hamilton County has remained fairly flat over the last three weeks. So I'm hopeful that with continued messaging about the need to wear masks and social distance, that we can continue to be somewhat guarded and protect our community so we don't start to see this uptick in cases. Our percent positivity remains at about 3.8% for Hamilton County. That's remained consistent since the beginning of March. We are continuing to see a fairly consistent level of testing as well uh, since the beginning of March. So people who need tested, uh, there's plenty of opportunity out there in our community to get tested. I recommend you uh, visit one of the test and protect sites which are funded by the Hamilton County Commissioners. And there's plenty of sites throughout the county to get yourself uh, or, uh, tested. Uh, similar to our case numbers, because our case numbers have been so flat, our reproductive number continues to be fairly uh, flat as well. We have been hovering just above and just below 1.0 for several weeks now. Today, our reproductive number is 0 0.95, and for the 14-county region, we are at 0 0.97. The other good news here is that while um, our cases remain flat, so do our hospitalizations, and they remain at a much lower rate than they were uh, several months back. So today in Hamilton County and the 14 county region, we have 149 individuals within our uh, hospital systems, of which about 40 are in the intensive care unit. Um, so really
really good news from the perspective of we're not seeing any increases here. We're continuing to manage our cases at a much better level, and our hospital systems have had uh, the ability to manage these cases better. The other interesting fact is we found out in talking with some of the hospital systems that many of those within our hospitals are younger than they were earlier in the pandemic. Uh, many individuals in the hospitals are under 60, which is quite a shift from where we were. And I think this is directly attributed to the amount of vaccine that we are able to get in those over the age of 60. I'll show you in a few moments uh, what that looks like here locally. I mentioned briefly a moment ago about the Ohio alert system. There are currently three metrics that are flagged. Indicator one has us flagged for being above 50. Uh, to transition out of a county with high incidence, we must drop below 100. And that would be the trigger point for us going back to orange or level two. In addition, indicator three, which deals with the number of patients within congregate living or nursing homes versus our general population is flagged. And indicator four, which we had a small increase in emergency department visits a couple weeks back is currently flagged. I anticipate that metric to though go back to uh, green here shortly. Shifting over to talk about vaccines, I've been proud of Hamilton County. We've continued to be above the state of Ohio when it comes to the number of vaccines administered. Here countywide, we have over 50 providers that have been successful in getting nearly 37% of our population vaccinated their first dose of vaccine. We know that there have been over 300,000 people who have started vaccine here in Hamilton County. And while our goal continues to be to have our entire population take the two dose, the, the full two dose uh, requirement for the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, we know that one shot provides significant immunity against uh, COVID-19. So we are making significant progress here. About 23% of our population has finished that series and we anticipate those numbers to continue to increase in coming weeks. A few moments ago, I referenced the age breakdown, really significant progress over the age of 60. And I think it's really uh, important to note the 70 to 80 year olds nearly 80% of them have accepted vaccine in our community. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about 80 being the golden number that we want to get to for our whole community. And if these uh, 70 to 80 year olds kind of make up the mindset of our community as a whole, then I think, I think the reality is we'll get there. It might take a little bit of time, but I think we as a community are working really hard to achieve that 80%. And so I'm excited to see that continued progress. Um, we are continuing to make progress on in minority vaccinations. Our Black and African American population has now received about 14.1% of the total vaccine here in Hamilton County. That needle is still continuing to shift slightly, um, but as a total population, about 20%. The one area where we still uh, see lagging is when you look at the male to female breakdown. Males are taking the vaccine at a much lower rate than females. So we'll have to continue to work on messaging and try and help increase and encourage uh, males in our community that the vaccine is safe and effective at keeping them protected as well as their family. Um, I'll talk about this slide, although the, the following slide, I'll talk about Jan the Janssen vaccine. This is the overall vaccine allocation that Hamilton County has been getting since the beginning of March. In general, um, the majority of this vaccine has been the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, <clears throat> which is good news from the perspective of a delay in the Janssen vaccine will have very little impact here in Hamilton County. It's my estimate that of the 45 to 50,000 doses that we as a county overall are receiving both from the state and the federal government, that about um, five to 7,000 of those doses would be the Janssen vaccine. So. Um, what that means is this week in Hamilton County, we're probably administering anywhere between 40 and uh, let's just say 45,000 vaccines, which is quite quite a lot of vaccine. Um, the other thing to note, you know, throughout the pandemic, there's been a lot of discussion about not being able to schedule an appointment. The demand has been so great that when a clinic opens up within an hour or sometimes even within minutes of that clinic opening up, all of the appointments are gone. For the first time in this pandemic, uh, really like a light switch this week, if somebody wants to be vaccinated this week, there are appointments to be had. Uh, if you use the ArmorVax app, which is being used by Hamilton County Public Health and the Cincinnati Health Department, there are plenty of appointments that can be filled up this week. 
And so I would encourage folks who maybe have taken a backseat to, to trying to get a vaccine just because it was so difficult. If that is you, I would encourage you now to start looking for those doses. In addition to the two health departments that I just mentioned, there are 50 other providers in Hamilton County, including some of the bigger chains like Walgreens and Kroger's and CVS, as well as some other types of pharmacies and all of our hospital systems that are offering vaccine. And many of those providers now have appointments, and so it's getting much easier to schedule an appointment. So please uh, use this as an opportunity to get yourself vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple slides on updated orders, and then I'll talk about, actually, I'm gonna jump ahead just so I can keep on vaccine, and then I'm gonna go back to the orders um, just so that we can keep the, the, the flow going. So speaking of the Janssen and Janssen vaccine, or I'm sorry, the J&J &J vaccine or the Janssen vaccine, um, we did hear this morning that the FDA and CDC did put a pause on the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This is not a mandate. They actually are allowing it up to each provider, although it is a recommendation from the state of Ohio that providers pause until we have uh, additional information. What we know is that there were of 7 million doses that, uh, administered in the United States, six females between the ages of 18 and 48 that developed a extremely rare blood clotting uh, event. And so the Centers for Disease Control and FDA are taking the most highest precautions. The concern um, is that we wanna make sure that we have safe vaccine and to do so they have to be very proactive and understand if there is a correlation between these uh, blood clotting events and the vaccine. There's, there's not that guarantee that that correlation exists, but they wanna be extra cautious. As mentioned on a previous slide, uh, Hamilton County is really seeing most of our doses as Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. So this will have some impact, but the impact is not going to be that great. We're going to do exactly what we've been doing for the last um, several months since the end of December, and we're just going to use the vaccine that we have. We're going to make appointments as open as possible, and we're going to keep doing the work that we're so proud of our community for doing, and that's, that's vaccinating our community. As mentioned, uh, both Pfizer and Moderna are highly effective vaccines. They are proven to be safe, and we know that after one dose, there's some science starting to show that they're 80% effective. So um, I think this is all good news. I think there's been a lot of questions. I've had several media inquiries about how this will play out and are we concerned? And ultimately, my biggest concern is that we are safe with our vaccine distribution. And I believe that we here in Hamilton County and the United States are, are doing a great job in ensuring patient safety. Am I a little disappointed that we'll have one less tool? Certainly. But at the end of the day, all of these tools have been helpful in our fight against COVID-19. Jumping backwards then, uh, just one last update since I last met with the commission. Uh, the state of Ohio has uh, substantially adjusted their director of health orders. Previously, there were a series of between 20 and 25 orders, many of which had several amendments to them uh, that kind of provided the overall guidance for the state of Ohio um, with relationship to masking and business operations, uh, social distancing and facial coverings. The new order is much simpler. It's a six page document and it's very straightforward and easy to understand. Um, the good news about these orders uh, is that they do offer some relief in many areas. They still require facial coverings when you're in an indoor environment or if you're outdoors and unable to social distance. In addition, they discourage groups larger than 10 and really continue to reemphasize the importance of social distancing on preventing the spread of COVID-19. Uh, it does allow for some large gatherings, um, particularly in the outdoor environments. And in those orders, it talks about the need to discourage individuals from standing too close together or hanging out in large, large groups. So there is some opportunity now for festivals and things that we haven't seen in more than a year to, to resume. In addition, in an indoor environment, uh, they are fixing seating at 25%. Outdoor environments do not list a specific seating requirement, although it does talk about the need to have um, groups of no more than 10 with tables or rows of seating six feet apart. So we are still trying to create some distance and some breakages in the spread of uh, COVID-19. In addition, uh, signage, signage, including uh, social distancing and the need to wear masks are still required as a part of these orders. I believe that is all the slides I have, but I'd be happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Commissioner Kesterman. Um, I would just like to bring up my concern uh, as it relates to the J&J &J, uh, vaccine. Specifically, there was a rush to vaccinate homeless and seniors, which are our most vulnerable population. I understand you were saying there were six females that were identified as possibly having a blood clotting issue. And I'm just wondering, is there any way um, follow up that people can check on these homeless people who only wanted the one dose or check on um, the seniors that only got the one uh, dose? Um, I'm just really concerned about those who have no one to report uh, their symptoms to anyone. So uh, at a high level, really, it's up to each individual to follow up if they have concerns. I failed to mention the concerns typically with regards to uh, the Janssen vaccine and the um, blood clotting would be severe headaches, uh, significant abdominal pain, leg pain, shortness of breath within three weeks of getting the shot. <clears throat> we, we would encourage everyone to contact their health care provider if they have one. But certainly not all members of our community, including the homeless population, have a health care provider. In those mm -hmm. instances, if you're concerned about your health, we would we would ask you to seek uh, medical attention, mm -hmm. including going to the emergency room if, if you're concerned. Um, mm -hmm. The only other offer that I can say is that we ask for folks to watch out for their neighbors. So if, mm -hmm. if you're part of the homeless community, we would ask one another to watch out and to report things that don't look right so that we don't mm -hmm. we don't have any instances. And mm -hmm. the final piece I just want to continue to reiterate is out of 7 million doses, we've only had a potential of six instances. We don't know that those are linked back, but it is mm -hmm. very, very, very rare. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice President Reese. Uh, thank you. Um, just want to follow up. Uh, can you talk about the, uh, I believe the 16 year old um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I may be wrong on this one, but was it the J and J for the 16 year olds or what, which one were they doing on 16 year olds? Uh, anyone who is 16 or 17 is only eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccine. It's the only vaccine approved. Okay. Okay, good. And, um, are we, do we have a, um, a hotline number if, People, I know you say your your medical provider, but if someone goes to one of these mass back places and they feeling something, I've been hearing, you know, people legs swelling up that have the second shot. I mean, I'm hearing some nightmares on the second shot. Um, is there a hotline? Are we documenting this, or is that something we should be doing, or no? So at every vaccine clinic, uh, the providers should be giving out <laughs> information about the VAERS system, the VAERS system, which is a federally run program to monitor vaccines. And the beauty of the system is it's given out to everyone within the United States. And so over time, we are actually able to gather more information about the vaccine successfulness and about symptomology from these vaccines. And so all symptoms, including any kind of swelling after taking the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, we would encourage you to report it to the VAERS system. At any time, though, it's important to note that if you really do become concerned with your health, um, the best bet is to seek medical attention. <clears throat> gotcha. And are we uh, documenting? Like, is there have have you seen any uh, reports about any uh, issues? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There are several studies that actually provide updates on how the vaccine campaign is going. Um, we actually have learned more about the safety uh, of the vaccine with pregnancy as well as while breastfeeding, um, as well as different age groups. And so uh, I don't have those specifics with me, but lots of information about what percentage of patients uh, after getting the Moderna or the Pfizer or the Janssen uh, come down with headaches or come down with a fever or come down with chills. There's lots of data at this mm -hmm. point kind of updating uh, the public on those, on those uh, outcomes. Okay, yeah, I just was wondering in terms of, you know, Hamilton County or county, what, you know, is out there because, you know, what to expect. Some people say, okay, well, this is what to expect, so I don't need to go get medical attention. Um, one other thing I do I do want to raise, uh, mammograms. So I just found out if you're getting your mammogram, you, what I was told from the medical folks is that you, if you get the shot, you have to wait uh, six to eight weeks before getting a mammogram because of some potential lip nose swelling and maybe some false 
um, I guess you would get a false report. Um, so that's one of the questions that have been, you know, asked if you get your mammogram. And I know uh, certainly that's an important component. It was first thing that I've heard. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, I have actually not heard anything about that. Um, I would be happy to research it, talk to my medical director, and, and update the commission. If anyone, though, before I have an opportunity to update the commission has concerns about that and has an appointment scheduled, I would recommend you speak with your, your provider before you have that mammogram. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I guess information that I received, that's why I was putting it out there. And I thought that would be something, if you know, if that is something widespread, we could uh, get that information to the people. So. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a special welcome for Commissioner Driehaus. Oh. Because she was not sure if she would make it today because she had a <laughs> second shot. So we That's welcome right. you. And I was I told you you were gonna be fine. So well, I, I told my staff, you know, I'm feeling a little subdued today, and that's okay. not always a bad thing. So okay. <laughs> okay. I, uh, my my arm hurts and I'm a little lower key than usual. So all is well okay. down in the Dree House office. Um, so hey, I just wanted to follow up with Greg because um, you know, we have seen this um small spike of increased cases throughout the state and Hamilton County is not seeing that knock wood um, and some of the rurals are seeing it some of the urbans are seeing it um, and I would like to Greg to just um, try to think about you know what we're doing correctly in Hamilton County so we can learn from it and continue to do things correctly so uh, Greg what do you attribute that to so, you know, I don't have, a, I, I can only hypothesize, but I truly believe, and I've said this many times, that our businesses and citizens have really worked hard as a team to get through this pandemic. We have clearly been a leader in the state of Ohio. And so I'd like to, I'd really like to attribute it to the hard work of our residents. And I really hope that we can continue this trend and finish up this pandemic without seeing any major increases. Thank you. Yeah, it just, you know, it's it's a it's a little striking because you hear the governor talking about this increase uh, and then you look at Hamilton County's numbers. It's like, oh, so mm -hmm. I, I hope that we're just not behind the curve, by the way. Um, but um, at least so far, we're kind of holding steady at, a, at around 100. So thank you mm -hmm. for that information. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Kesterman, for your information and your updates. As always, we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. So. Thank you so much. Sounds great. Thank you, Commissioner. So our next item on the agenda, get out the vax, 80% vaccinated by July 4th is an initiative. And I am not going to even introduce her because she has a way of introducing herself. I don't know, Kate, are you speaking first or, or Regina? She, she just gives it uh, to us. So <laughs> she's laughing. So welcome both of you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I will do the wind up and hand it over okay. to my better half here, uh, okay. Regina Carswell Russo, after that. And appreciate the opportunity to be here. And thanks to Health Commissioner Kesterman for his leadership on this and the entire commission. It's I do think the reason that we are seeing a, a continued strong response in this area and not having the cases ticking up in the same way is because of the strong leadership, the work of our citizens and our community on vaccinations, on masking, on social distancing. And um, let's, let's continue that. So I am gonna share my screen here. Um, one moment, let's see. This is, um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So wanna talk a bit about our Get Out the Vax effort, which is a regional campaign that we are unique in this region um, of launching an effort to energize and mobilize our entire community around vaccination and not just for vaccination but even more broadly towards a healthy thriving 20s for our community so um, we had the roaring 20s in the 1900s and we are working towards a thriving 20s here in um, this decade and one of the, there's a couple key components to our get out the vax efforts. And one is having a real focus on making it easy to be vaccinated, removing barriers 
and getting excited. And um, the first piece of this is for the second and fourth weekends in April and May, having dedicated Get Out the Vax weekends. And on these weekends, we just had the first one this past weekend um, on the 10th and 11th, and we offered over 20,000 first dose vaccination appointments across the community. And that involved a number of sites, not just higher volume sites like Duke and Cintas and Northern Kentucky Convention Center, Wilmington Air Park. It also involved over 20 community sites around the region, including a new site up at, in Tri-County Mall that's run by Sterling Rapid Response. It's targeting the Hispanic community and Latinx community. It involved a new standing pop-up clinic that the Urban League is doing um, on Sunday afternoons, every Sunday. It involved um, clinics in Westwood and Avondale and all over the community. So one of the benefits here in this area is that we want to I think in a lot of places you've seen a real focus on these just high volume mass vaccination sites. And here in the Cincinnati, Hamilton County region, we are really lucky to have so many strong providers, not just at larger sites, but also in our community sites. And transportation has been a big barrier for folks. So we wanted to work working with Metro here in Hamilton County and Tank in Northern Kentucky that on Get Out the Vax weekends, Public transit is completely free. You don't need a voucher. It is just um, completely free. And for those who are not on a um, bus line, there's also a possibility of individual rides through Lyft or through a couple other community partners, Cancer Justice Network and Council on Aging are also offering this. For anybody who has a vaccination appointment and needs a ride, but um, public transit isn't an option. So for those folks, we urge them to call 211 who can help figure out the best um, transportation option for those individuals. And as part of the Get Out the Vax effort, um, we are working as a 15 county region because we know that in order to really fully reopen and get our region back, it doesn't matter if just one county or one part of our region um, is doing well, we all have to be doing well to really be safe and fully reopen. So we have this big, bold, ambitious goal of getting to 80% of those who are eligible. So everybody 16 plus, at least a first dose vaccine by July 4th. And we are the only, we're the only region in the state and I, I'm not aware of another area that has set this big regional goal. It's across the tri-state area. When we launched this a week ago, um, uh, we were at 35%. And as of yesterday, we are now at 42%. So we are making good progress. That is seven points in the percentage points in our first week. And as a data person, I did when we launched this last week, um, was doing the math, you know, over 13 weeks, how much do we have to gain a week to be able to get to our 80% goal? And we've got to average 3.5% uh, a week. So mm. did much better than that in the first week. It is obviously going to be a lot easier to get higher percentage points in the early weeks. As we move further along, it's going to get harder and harder. But did want to commend um, the commission, our community, all of our healthcare community for the progress that we are making and um, underscore the importance of continuing to focus on this. We have these thermometers on electronic billboards around the city. It will be shown on occasion at Fountain Square, at Reds games. This is our community's thermometer to immunity and um, really want to help work together to get to that 80% by July 4th, which admittedly is very ambitious, but I, I truly believe we can do this. Mm -hmm. And with that, I am gonna hand it over to Regina. So thank you, Kate, I appreciate it. And just to um, make a little bit of education of how I'm brought into the campaign, I uh, represent the Regional COVID Communications Center that for the past year has been aligning and amplifying messaging COVID prevention strategies to help businesses and individuals live, work, and play safely through the stages of the pandemic. This is the work we've been doing when we launched the masks on, when we did the getting to zero, and now we've reiterated that with our now get to 80 and get out the vax and helping to amplify this brilliant campaign to get everyone their shot of hope in their arm. Across the region, the partners have all come together. This is what we do in the region. This is very unique and it is a story that is worthy to be told that across sectors from healthcare, business, government, community organizations, individuals, mom and pops, everyone coming together to accelerate this process and the progress of the vaccines. You'll see on the right-hand side, the regional partners that help us 
elevate and launch the campaign, but behind them, scores of warriors and soldiers who are joining us and more are joining every single week. The Get Out the Vax primarily working to remove barriers, like Kate was talking, to getting the vaccine. So how do we do that? Well, Fidelity jumped up and they said, we will help with marketing this. We will help to market that Tank and Metro is gonna provide free public transportation. And the regional hospitals came together and like, hey, we're gonna work with the United Way. And we're gonna make sure that lift rides are available. And we're gonna make sure that all diverse communities are impacted. And the Red said, you know what? We're gonna offer some free, not free, mm, I just gave them a little bit more off. We're gonna have some discounts on their tickets if you have a vaccination. And what we're seeing is that everyone who can do something, they are doing something. So this is, I'm gonna have a couple of call to action on this call today, is that if you're out there, if you're listening and you have a pathway to join this movement to help to incentivize or remove a barrier, we're asking that you help us. We say mm -hmm. that it's a healthy region for a thriving 20s because getting the vaccine is the first step to being healthy. And now that we have a captive audience and people are coming to get this vaccination so they can live their lives, we know we can't stop there. We have to continue to promote, elevate and educate our community about staying healthy. Throughout this season of the pandemic, we were uh, cooking and we were, and we were eating healthy food and we were taking walks and enjoying our great park system. And we were buying bikes. I even bought one and I don't, even know how to ride a bike, but I bought a bike, right? So that we can engage in our bike trails and our beautiful ecosystem here in the region. We don't want to lose that. And so we want a healthy region because we know when we have healthy individuals, we have healthy communities, healthy neighborhoods, healthy businesses, and a healthy economy. And that means a thriving 20s. The last uh, messaging, call to action, don't wait. Don't wait, there's no reason to wait. We're making it easy for you. Get your vaccinations now because we wanna hit that wonderful spot on the 4th of July when we have our family reunions and we have our get togethers. There's so much in store for us on the horizon if we do what we need to do now and that is continue with our protocols with masks where appropriate, social distancing, getting the vaccine, eating healthy and moving ahead and through this pandemic. So the next slide is uh, a little bit of the coverage that we received after we launched the campaign. This is just a snapshot of some of the media hits that we got within 48 hours of launching this campaign. And unfortunately, I don't have the updated social media statistics, but this is just a glimpse of 36 hours after we launched the campaign. And what's interesting about this is the people that were sharing it. It wasn't just the people who were at the press conference, nope. Everyone was sharing with everyone, which also goes to underscore how we're going to get people to get the vaccines. Not beautiful hashtags. People will make a move on what they will do for their health by people that they know. And so this is the second call to action. If you see Get Out the Vax on your social media, if you see in information about how you can access vaccines, we are calling for the community to share this information on social media and tell everyone about the benefits of getting the vaccine. That's also another way for us to dispel a misinformation that's out there by sharing correct information. And then the night before what we did was that we asked our partners if they would like to help us light the region up in orange. Orange because it is the color of hope, measured enthusiasm, excitement and great health. And so we asked them to light their buildings up with orange the night before to show the region what is to come the day after the weekend of Get Out the Vax. We had Paul Brown Stadium, Procter and Gamble turned orange for us. And then we had Kentucky with St. Elizabeth and Kenton County sign and the College of Informatics, UC Health. We had uh, Duke Energy Center. It was beautiful. And we mm -hmm. hope to do this again, to wash our region in orange and to wrap this idea that we can be a healthy region together. These are the main messages that we're putting forward with the Get, it, the, get Out the Vax campaign. Because again, if people are hesitant to get the vaccine, we're trying to pull them in by also talking about being healthy overall. And so that's one of the strategies. Now, and this is where um, that um, 
I'm so sorry, that um, Kate can help me with this. Opportunities moving forward. With a campaign like this, pivoting, moving, and being fluid is gonna be our friend. Changing up messaging, depending on the audience, is gonna be our tool. So some of the opportunities that we have ahead is making sure that we are connecting with all of the diverse communities out there, African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, and rural commun communities, and the organizations and the people that these communities trust and that they listen to so that we can help bring the, the, the campaign language and also help to set up vaccine sites. We're mobilizing employers and businesses. As you saw uh, last week, the governor says the businesses now can help us with uh, partnering with providers and employers want their employees back in the office. And so we're gonna have them to help mobilize us to ensure that their employees can stay safe, strengthening partnerships with regional public health departments. And one of our messages, the convenience. We're making it easy, we're having multiple sites and we're bringing the vaccine and sites to you. The next area of, uh, of dense promotion will be paid media marketing to help us uh, reiterate what we're saying, grassroots and earned media, and then also always looking for new opportunities, access and pathways to get to 80 and get out the vax. Kate and I just had a conversation this morning with um, the Thunderdome group and they are providing a vaccine clinic next Monday for their staff. There's more than 400 of them. And then they are opening up to the entire hospitality group. This is what we do in this region. Hospitality group has been hit very hard and yet they are the first ones to step up to the plate to show that they care for their employees and their families and they care for the region so that everyone uh, is safe and that we can open this region up safely. Do you want to add something, Kate? I think that was perfect. I think we are exactly as you said, the purpose of the get out the vax effort is it's an umbrella campaign that is meant to support and amplify all the efforts, the great efforts that are taking place across our partners, whether that's public health departments, businesses, hospitals, pharmacies, um, community organizations. So this is, we are here, it's going to be taking place every two weeks in advance. Of, so in the second and fourth weekends in April and May are the Get Out the Vax efforts. And then a few days before that, we'll be doing a press event to showcase some of the, the main efforts coming up on that um, Get Out the Vax weekend and really welcome any input, suggestions on how we can continue to strengthen this um, going forward. Okay, thank you. I'm so excited. I can't sit still. <laughs> I mean, it's just so much to, to say. This campaign is just awesome. Just a couple things, uh, the free Metro rides. Um, I know people that know people that ride the bus and they were like in shock that they're free. I don't have to pay anything. So that's one, one of the things I wanted to bring up. So that has really helped the mood in the community like you don't know. And then my chief of staff came up with a great idea that I'm sure uh, he and Bridget are working together to forward to you guys to uh, uh, get the businesses even more uh, involved. And so um, lastly, I'm just so excited. Um, I've had my two shots. You make me want to get a third shot. So, uh, but this is so important. Um, and so I'm, I'm just really excited about it, whatever I can do to further. And I've been telling everybody about it. I met with the CVB executive committee, as you were saying earlier, and I've told them every meeting that I'm on, uh, I met with Senator Brown and just told him. So it, this is just an exciting time and we'll get to where we need to be. So I'm gonna stop right there. And uh, Vice President Reese, do you have any comments? Yeah, I just wanna say, um... Of course, I, Kate, you and I saw each other, I think, uh, was it last month uh, at the briefing uh, with uh, Commissioner Driehaus. Uh, so I know you said something like this was coming and I appreciate it. And just wanna also say to uh, Regina, um, she and I go way back um, and I'm just so excited to hear that she's uh, involved in this. And I do wanna highlight something Early on, um, I, don't, I think I might have just got elected or just got sworn in. I think it just got sworn in. And I want to say something that you put together, uh, which uh, really speaks a lot to your relationships. Some of you, many who are watching may remember you from Fox 19 uh, with uh, you created What's Hot. And 
everyone went to Fox 19 to figure out what is going to happen this weekend because Regina Croswell knew everything and you were Croswell there, now you're Russo. And, um, but the fact that you were able to bring all of the different TV stations together um, in, I believe, prime time television uh, to stop what they were doing commercial free, um, bring business community together uh, to have um, radio stations that are usually competitors. I think you had uh, Lincoln Ware and WLW, 700 WLW and Lincoln Ware, all of the stations um, stopping what they were doing about how important it was to fight this pandemic together. Um, and I do want to highlight you and your company, uh, what you were able to do uh, that you came up with and brought all of the people to the table. And I just want to say that that does not go unnoticed. And now uh, in your partnership with uh, Kate and what you're doing uh, together, I just want people to who are watching and people that we are dealing with, um, this is the type of partnership that I'm very much interested in. Uh, diverse people who can come together, uh, who can get things done. Um, you know, uh, Regina is a, a, a woman-owned, minority-owned company. Um, and all that you did, I certainly hope that <laughs> you are getting compensated for that, because I don't know anyone who can get 5, 9, 12, 19 to stop in prime time to come together with one voice, one message uh, back to my one Hamilton County like you were able to do. Uh, so certainly I hope that um, to see you work on this campaign uh, as well as others. Uh, earlier, Madam President, I was on with the CBB. Uh, they've got a, a campaign uh, that you, Commissioner Driehaus, are aware of uh, that's getting ready to come out. Uh, get your sensi on. And in my meeting with them, while well, I think this is a good campaign, I reemphasized at the CBB, uh, you know, these are the types of partnerships that we want to see, uh, where we have minority companies like uh, Ms. Russo's company, what Kate has been able to do, that can bring all these things together. Because we are, we have a lot of campaigns, but it's one Hamilton County. It's whether we reopen businesses. We, we got to be safe to open the business. Uh, we put money to help the business stay afloat. Now we got to market to get the people come to the business. We got to make sure the people get vaccinated so they're safe to come in the business. And just breaking down these silos, which is one of my biggest things, because we all know in marketing and branding that you got to have one brand, one market, and one direction. Um, and all of us play a role, whether it's tourism, whether it's business whether it's going to employment. So um, again, I just want to highlight the work and uh, say I'm excited uh, as well of the work, but also showcasing this example when people say, we can't find a minority business that's qualified. <laughs> Turn your TVs on, zoom in. Uh, we found them and they're doing a good job. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I just want to say thank you for your support for the entire commission. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Reese, we go back a long way and it's going to be <laughs> wonderful to continue to help support you and get that bus out there, right? Yeah. Get it everywhere. Yeah, and just... The bus, Madam, Madam President, Madam Commissioner, I'm getting all kind of calls. My my office is getting calls about this bus. We even got a call from a, someone having a baby shower and they want the bus. I said, so we're working on it. Uh, uh, Jeff is working on it, the team. And when it gets going, we want to be right there with you know, mm -hmm. get the backs and we want to be a part of the campaign. Thank you. And I think what's really good is the residents should know that we're not waiting on a bus, that we are right now out reaching people. And so the bus would be an addition to what we're already doing. So uh, thank you so much. So our laid back commissioner, Commissioner Driehaus. <laughs> I have to be laid back because I'm always cold. But yeah, anyway, um, just one to uh, pile on about the collaboration. You know, the Health Collab has really uh, stepped up here uh, and done a remarkable job in organizing all of us, the private sector, the public sector, hospitals, public health, and the business community and, and the chamber, you know, with Regina 
um, leading the charge with this media campaign and other media campaigns. So um, thanks for what you're doing. Um, 80% is an aggressive goal, uh, but you know, we're doing better than the rest of the states. So why not? I mean, you know, <laughs> and we're consistently doing better. I hope I'm not jinxing it, but, um, but anyway, so, uh, we will do our best to help you promote uh, this message to get the residents in the county uh, vaccinated because in the end, you know, that's what's going to make sure that the businesses are open, the schools remain open, and we all remain safe. So thanks so much to, to the both mm -hmm. of you and your teams for all the work you're doing. Okay. Thank you both ladies um, for what you're doing. And I know we'll be hearing back from you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We'll go to our next agenda item, which is uh, National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Andy Knapp is here. I see him. Good Hello, afternoon. Sir. Good afternoon. Um, it's great to uh, actually welcome you, I think probably for the first time in our history, uh, to the actual uh, communication center. Um, mm. I've, I've given a chance uh, for you to actually see inside uh, the men and women that are doing the day-to-day -day work here for the communication center. I, I know we have occasionally brought some of the dispatch staff down to, to appear in front of you. I don't know that we've ever brought you to the communication center. So a quick overview of, of this. And we're in somewhat of a celebratory uh, mode, if you will. Uh, the second week of April every year is set aside as the uh, uh, National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week. And that's done to honor the sacrifice and the service uh, across the nation of all the, uh, the uh, people who have chosen this as their, their vocation and work in this profession tirelessly 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no question in my mind whatsoever that, uh, that the quality of life in our community is directly related to the quality uh, within your 911 center, getting the, the residents in direct contact and immediate contact with our public safety uh, providers is, is a responsibility that we do not take lightly here. Um, also joining me, if, if she has a, a moment to, to uh, turn on, is uh, Ms. Sarah Dooley. Sarah is a, uh, a three-year veteran with our organization, and she's the current president of the uh, communications officers uh, uh, union that we have here. Um, Sarah is also a veteran, um, so thank you for your service, uh, Sarah. And I don't know if Sarah, if you have a couple of words that you'd like to say um, um, at this point. If Sarah's on. Um, yep, yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, first of all, just uh, like Andy said, I mean, I am very new to the agency and this is a, uh, a little overwhelming being part of this whole commissioner meeting, but it's actually really cool um, just to kind of see everything that you guys are doing and in the background and kind of just how it all ties into what we do in that room behind Andy there. Um, so I want to thank you all for the invite. Listening to you guys speak is, is pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for the opportunity to kind of spotlight us during this week. Uh, we do put a lot of hard work into that room 24 hours a day and over time and just really just working very hard to help with the community. And as you guys were with this whole COVID stuff, I mean, we really push that as well um, in our community. And Andy does a really good job at getting information out to us. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You did well, Sarah. You didn't seem too nervous to me. <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sarah, and Sarah does a great job. And Sarah is is the youth of the organization. She's the future of the organization. Mm. And uh, and I'm I'm quite proud of the work that she does. She she uh, works on our night shift, so she uh, may have gotten up a little bit early uh, than her normal routine to to actually join us. Um, mm. And and I, I I would be remiss um, if I if I paid tribute to the youth of the organization without recognizing some of the, of the senior folks of the organization, I'm gonna step mm -hmm. sideways. Um, I have Mr. Uh, Robert Pounds, come on in Robert. Uh, Robert is a oh. dispatcher with us, Hi. has uh, uh, been a dispatcher for 33 uh, years. In three uh, months. In three months. Um, and I'll let Robert kind of introduce himself and tell a little bit about him. Yes, I'm Robert Pounds. And as I said, I've been here 33 years and three months and I've seen exactly this organization grow and and manifest itself with all the new technologies. And, you know, when I first arrived here, we were barely CAD positive as far as having a computer aided dispatch. And now there's a whole environment of cell phones that has changed the entire dynamic of 
of what we do and what people expect. When people dial 911, they expect us to be able to know exactly where they are and react with whatever situation that they come to us with. And it's it's been a wonderful, wonderful ride during all these years. And uh, I've loved it, every minute of it and all of the wonderful leadership that we've had during those years, which Andy has been around almost as long as I have. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Robert, so much. I saw Andy kind of poke you uh, to say about the leadership. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. But um, I have a, just a couple comments, Andy. If you were uh, finished, did you have anything else? You no. Want? The only thing I point out is is uh, it's it's men and women like like uh, like Sarah and Robert that make this organization the great thing mm -hmm. it is. I'm incredibly proud to represent them. Um, I, I, I say this in front of you, and, and, and I say it to many people, that this is absolutely my dream job. There's no place mm -hmm. I'd rather be. Um, and I've worked my entire career in the 911 industry. I've been in, in the 911 system since 1988. And um, it's interesting to note, just last year, for example, to give you an idea of the scale of, of what we operate with, we processed 582,000 telephone calls in and out of this dispatch center last year. Out of that, we had about 249,000 that were uh, 911 calls uh, destined for us. And out of that 249,000, I'm proud to say that we answered um, 94, uh, let me see here, I got my notes, um, about 94% of our 911 traffic was answered within 10 seconds or less. And, uh, and the, the state mandate is that we have to match at least 90%. So we, we continually, uh, despite the struggles we have, as you heard me talk before, we have a, a, a very difficult time in finding the right quality person, the right person that will stay in this career and, and, and make it a career versus a stepping stone. And we're incredibly shorthanded. We are on, a, on the, the lookout to recruit talented individuals who are willing to sacrifice some weekends, some holidays, some overnights in order to better serve the public. But I'm proud to say, despite the troubles we're having with our staffing, our staff has really stepped up and we continue to operate within um, better than what the national standards are. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm proud of the support that each and every one of you commissioners have provided to us. The technology we have here is incredibly expensive, um, but it's also incredibly important. Again, it directs it relates directly back to the quality of life that we have here in the organization. So uh, on behalf of everyone here, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the recognition uh, for this week. And, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, the area looks a little bigger than I was there about 10 years ago. and looked like you've expanded just a little bit since I was there. The, it's a mm -hmm. great thing. Yeah, the, works, the workstations have been expanded. Um, we, we are, um, we, we've got an awful lot of, of things you know, in a, in a very tight area now. And so uh, Jeff uh, Aludo and Holly are looking uh, desperately to try to help us out with the situation we are with our building. Our building is quite crowded right now mm -hmm. as a result of that technology. Sure. Okay, very good. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to say before I open it up to our commissioners, um, I appreciate you bringing this forward. I was not aware of this, didn't see this in any kind of literature that I had, but I would certainly like to present um, something to you and your staff that you can put up on the wall or something, even though it would be after the fact. Um, I certainly want to pull something together for your crew. That'd be fantastic, thank you. Great, uh, Vice President Reese. I just wanna say uh, thank you for your work and uh, it's great hearing from your staff, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Driehaus. Yeah, thanks Andy, thanks to the team. Uh, thanks to those that were able to jump on, uh, Sarah and Robert. Um, yeah, you know, I think, you guys um, do this work and it's you're like the unsung heroes sometimes because you're doing it every day and oftentimes we hear about it when things get challenging um, and you know in the meantime you're you're saving lives and you're doing this work every single day so uh, I'm grateful that you brought this to our attention and um, you, you guys deserve the recognition for sure thanks for what you do thank you very much thank you uh, Jeff did you want to make any comments uh, certainly, Madam President, thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Sarah and and Robert as well, and obviously uh, Andy and the entire team uh, out at the Communications Center. Um, th this is just a group of employees that, um, you know, I'm just humbled by every single day because of what they do. Uh, and anyone who's ever been out to the comm center and, and sat with these folks just know the incredible um, amount of professionalism and technical expertise and 
understanding that comes along with with the job, as well as the level of empathy that they have to have for the people uh, who call in every day. I mean, th these are th this work group of Hamilton County is is the group that day in and day out has to respond uh, to residents of this county who many times are having the absolute worst day they are ever going to have in their life. Uh, and it's, it's one thing to take that call. It's another thing to be able to take that call, answer it professionally, provide them the help they need, and also make sure that you're being empathetic to the situation that they're going through. You know, there's one thing that sets um, this unit apart from um, you know, other places in the country, and I've heard this directly from police officers and firefighters, it's that level of empathy and it's that level of understanding to the caller and to the, and to the first responder uh, who is dealing with that call that this group exhibits. So couldn't be more proud of, of, our, of our group, uh, of, of the entire communication center, its leadership team, um, and just want to congratulate them uh, and uh, wish them a, a great National Telecommunicators Week. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you both. Thank Thanks, you, Andy. staff, that you had come forward. We thank you. Take care. Yep, thank you. Take care. Uh -huh. Okay, we have another, our next agenda item. Uh, before we go to that, though, I'd like to open it up to our commissioners if there are any comments that you have that you'd like to make before we go into our executive session. Vice President Reese. Yes, um, I'd like to, I know the, the bus was mentioned and I know that we have, uh, we had a lot of support from the community uh, that were asking for us to to do this and I didn't want to leave the impression that it was slow walked or moved to the side. We've done a lot of work on it. I know we're in Minority Health Month now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd like to have Jeff uh, to kind of update us on where we are with it. I, Cause I'd, I know I got questions from Joe Mallory from NAACP and Eddie Cohen from the Urban League. Uh, so I know it was mentioned earlier and I just wanted to uh, didn't want people to think it was just pushed to the side. Uh, so Jeff has done a lot of work on this. We're trying to move things. Can you maybe give us a, a little update for those who are interested? Yeah, yeah, happy, happy to, Commissioner. So um, yeah, and, and as Commissioner Reese knows, we've uh, uh, talked several times on this. Um, we're, we are, as she indicated, we're absolutely not slow walking anything on this. Uh, we have Robert uh, Bell's uh, new engagement coordinator, Aisha Walker, who has started, who is giving this her, her full attention. And we're working multiple strategies right now. Uh, we're you know, in the process of delivering um, an, an asset, a fully programmed asset into the community to help expand our, um, our, uh, uh, our medical programming, um, as well as other social programming in, uh, of the county and amplifying that into the community. And it's really it's, uh, you know, we can all talk about, you know, we're, we're delivering a bus, but this is, I mean, this is a uh, go, going to be a well thought out constructed program. Uh, and so there's a lot of work to do to both uh, se for, uh, secure that asset, develop the programming around it. So I know uh, we were working on a strategy um, in some, with some of our partners here locally to get an asset rolled out as quickly as possible. Um, uh, if possible in, in uh, Minority Health Month this month, but uh, possibly in early May uh, as well. Um, and at the same time, um, looking at that long-term strategy of actually uh, procuring uh, an asset for the county to be a part of the long-term vision of this uh, as well. So we've got multiple irons in the fire on that. And so I'm hope we'll continue to provide reports to the board on a, on a weekly basis on it. Um, but yes, we are advancing this um, as, as quickly as we as we possibly can. Hope to have something out uh, to the public to uh, to amplify our uh, county services and vaccine delivery uh, very quickly. Thank you. I appreciate that. And there's a lot of moving parts. I want to also thank the um, governor's office and Kroger's senior vice president group, uh, UC Health CEO, uh, Mr. Lofgren, uh, and so many others. Uh, from the top that have put people on to help us with this for a public private partnership. So I'm excited about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so uh, Kroger's and Lofgren and how, how are they instrumental in this process? Specifically Kroger's. I, yeah, I Kroger's, if, I, if you remember my presentation I made, 
Kroger's uh, is offered to put up $20,000 and staffing for, uh, for the bus. Uh, law friend, UC Health, uh, you remember from the presentation, uh, they've offered to be the service uh, provider and also provide us also with a uh, temporary uh, bus to get started uh, and also be one of the medical uh, providers of it. So they're working out all of those uh, details. But uh, remember, to even get to the resolution, they had to bring a whole lot to the table. It wasn't like you just wrote a resolution. There was a lot of research. There was a lot of uh, partnerships that people came forward. Uh, and then there's a lot of community partners uh, that have come forward as well. Everyone from the Health Gap to the Urban League, to the NAACP, to the Free Store Food Bank. Um, and that list kind of goes on. So mm -hmm. uh, everybody's ready to try to help. And it's been a, a, a team effort to try to help get this moving forward. So I've been very appreciative. So I, I certainly uh, remember the presentation. I was just wondering about Kroger specifically because we ultimately have financially can afford this ourselves. But if they want to be a partner in some way, I was just uh, confused on them wanting to donate money for that purpose. So um, um, anything else? No, I think that's it right now. I don't want to Usually when I put up something, there's a lot of questions. So I'll, I'll, I will close out right now. <laughs> well, I, I think questions are good um, to oh, get yeah, some oh, clarity. Yeah, I, lots of them too. I, just, yeah. I know I did uh, spark a lot of questions. So I'm done for the day. Okay. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Because probably when you spark questions, the people that are watching, they might want to ask and they can't really get in or hadn't thought about asking. So thank you for your clarity. Uh, Commissioner Driehaus. I have nothing further. Thank you. At that point, then I'll make a motion to go into executive session pursuant to RC section 121.22G4 regarding collective bargaining. Second. Mr. Samar Dumas? Yes. Mr. Reese? Yes. Mr. Driehaus? Yes. 